Good morning and a warm welcome to our panelists and attendees to this webinar hosted by the South African Furniture Initiative, SAFI, in association with the South African Special Risk Insurance Association, SASRIA, and the Industrial Development Corporation, IDC. My name is Bernadette Isaacs. I'm the Managing Director of the South African Furniture Initiative, and I will be facilitating today's session. We will be starting off with some house rules. Uh, please note that the webinar is being recorded. Uh, your videos, mics uh, will be turned off and the chat facility will be disabled during the webinar. Uh, please pose your questions in the Q&A section during the webinar and questions from the presentations will be addressed um, in a, a Q&A session at the end of each presentation. We then move on to the program for today's session. Um, I will be giving a brief overview of who is SAFI, uh, the purpose of the webinar. Uh, SASRIA will then do a presentation. Um, IDC will do a presentation. I will then end off the session with the next steps and we'll then go into the thanks and closure. So to start off, um, who is the South African Furniture Initiative? We were created in 2016 as a joint initiative of industry, labor and government uh, for the benefit of all stakeholders in the furniture value chain. And our mandate is a sevenfold mandate. It is to provide market intelligence information, to facilitate training, mentoring and other support services, and to promote the South African manufacturing furniture industry, to facilitate access to domestic and international markets, to determine and facilitate the implementation of initiatives and programs that will enhance the performance of the South African furniture industry, and to sustain existing employment and create new employment opportunities within the furniture value chain. Lastly, to facilitate the development of strategic, strategic relationships throughout the furniture value chain. So just in terms of the purpose um, of today's webinar, um, SAFI put out a statement uh, about a month ago when the unrest and the looting um, um, impacted so many of us, especially in the KZN and the Gauteng provinces um, that happened across certain parts of the country, as I mentioned. Um, and in what we've done in terms of today's session was actually reach out um, to SASRIA and to IDC um, to, uh, as part of SAFI's um, support to the furniture industry to in these engagements bring um, the most relevant um, information that we could then uh, share with the industry to give the industry a voice and enable information sharing so that we can assist our industry with actually rebuilding um, um, our sector. So let me introduce you to our first speaker, uh, Mr. Muzi Ndladla from uh, SASRIA. Uh, Muzi joined uh, SASRIA in June of 2021 as executive manager, um, stakeholder management, bringing with him a wealth of knowledge and over 20 years experience in various managerial and executive level positions. These positions included head of risk, operations and underwriting manager, as well as the sales and marketing manager. Lucy skills cut, a, cut across the insurance value chain in both non-life and life insurance. Over to you, Musi. Thank you very much. Um, Benedict, um, and thank you for having me and greetings to everyone watching. All right, so um, I think because Sastra in particular, it plays a very critical role in rebuilding, first of all, um, particularly as it relates to the unrest that we, 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 we've had over the past couple of, of days, over the last month, actually. Um, and, and, and the damage that has, has, has happened, the economical cost is actually in billions, as you know, 
And, and the reason why I want to spend a little bit of time on, on Sastra itself is just so that, um, you know, there's appreciation of who Sastra is and, and why Sastra is particularly um, one of the topical institutions uh, right now. I mean, the way that we've been training over the past couple of uh, weeks has been really, you know, great because then we are able to showcase who we are and why we're here and, and to cover what sort of gaps that exist in the current market as it is right now. So I'll just go through briefly as to um, the, 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 the group structure as to how we are incorporated and how we are formed, as well as then go into detail as to who Sastra is and what role we play um, and, and why we are actually where we are and what is the value that we're going to bring, particularly in rebuilding, um, as well as um, uh, moving into what are the current gaps that we see as well existing, which is one of the main reasons why we're here, because we need to be able to cover those gaps. But first of all, we need to identify the gaps and cover them and discuss why those gaps exist and, and put solutions together insofar as how do we then proactively going into the future get to come up with solutions that would be beneficial in, in most in particular um, to the small to medium enterprises, as well as to individuals as well, like, like, your, like yourselves and, and, and me, you know, the, the unrest have really this time affected us a great deal. And I'll go a bit more into detail on that. So um, Sastra is, is a state-owned entity. That's, that's the first thing you see, even in the name, it's got an SOE and an SOC and pretty much um, we, we are held 100% by the National Treasury, so 100% state-owned. And at the same time, we, we are, you know, an entity that operates pretty much close to how the private sector operates. And I'll explain why I'm saying that, because in as much as we are a state-owned entity and we are 100% government-owned, we are a licensed insurer, first of all, um, through the Prudential Authority, and we are obviously being monitored by uh, the FSCA as well, just like any other insurance company uh, um, out there. And we are also a financial services provider um, um, in that respect. So we pretty much operate in a sense that like any other insurance company operates. But obviously we do understand that not many people really know about Satria, um, although most people and some would, particularly in the commercial space, but some, particularly in the small to medium enterprises space, might not even know who Sastra is. So which is pretty much why we, we are here and, and, and we're gonna talk about it just now. So the reason why we exist or, or actually looking at our mission is to, we want to be um, the one entity that specializes in identifying and managing special risks. Uh, I will get to describing and explaining exactly what we mean by special risks because it could have many different definitions, but for ourselves and for us, we have a specific definition for it. So, and that obviously requires then us to be an intellectual hub insofar as managing uh, um, special risks in particular. So I'm gonna move on to um, our mandate as such. So how were we incorporated? So there is an act that actually constitutes how we were incorporated and that is the, um, 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 the Sastra Convention Act, uh, uh, 134 of 1998. So pretty much um, it gave rise to Sastra as a company today because when it was started, it started more like um, you know, an insurance pool um, that was created to cover the gaps that existed at that particular time. So um, I will get as to say, what is it really that we cover? But first of all, let's look at the mandate. So our mandate, it requires us to focus on researching and investigating uh, pretty much uh, uh, specific risks that are regarded, uh, uh, risks that are of national interest. So in other words, we, you could have special risks that are currently in the market, but if the private sector is able to handle those private risks, then obviously then it means you just let that business be usual. But if those risks become so big that they end up getting to affect government and they end up having to affect the fiscus insofar as rebuilding, then those risks then get classified as special risks and they get ring fenced and they have to be managed in a particular way. Um, and at the same time, in as much as that is the mandate, we also require it to, posit to positively contribute to transformation since we are in the financial services sector. So for all intents and purposes, uh, Sastra is an insurance pool uh, by that it means we, we, we are the only entity that is authorized and is legislated to be able to operate in this particular space. 
Now, if you then ask us to say, so how does that look like? Then, and, and, and when Sasa was incorporated itself, what was the purpose to cover what specific uh, a risk in particular? So the first unrest that South Africa experienced that was the magnitude was so high that the private insurance companies out there were unable to handle the risk that it posed because it became more or less an uninsurable risk because um, the unrest as they do take place, there will be targets that are specific to specific uh, structures, to specific buildings, you know, um, and all of that type of insurance became very difficult for the private sector to handle. And government had then to step in at a point to be able to cover those because they would be the last uh, insurer of resort. And as such, then it becomes very difficult because then what they had to do on an annual basis, they had to reserve a lot of funds from the fiscus that would sit there and wait for eventualities like this to happen. And all of those funds that would be sitting there, they lost a lot of opportunity cost. So instead of keeping the money there and waiting until such time that there would be an unrest that happens, which would be devastating like what we're experiencing now, then Sasha was then formed. And the forming of Sasha was pretty much based on a, a simple risk management principle that you need to balance between your before the event risk mitigation as well as your after the event mitigation. Because the after the event mitigation is normally very difficult to manage because um, should it not materialize at any time, you still need to reserve those funds, first of all. And secondly, even when it materializes, it takes a long time for the state for a state for the state to get to the affected parties to get to relief as well. So export financing becomes a big issue because then the large companies can, can, can be able to be resilient and still be in business by the time that government gets to get to them and, and leave them. But the small to, to medium enterprises, they struggle and they fail and they actually get to be taken out of the stream of, of, of business because they wait for too long. By the time that the funding comes, there is no business to run anymore. So then Sastra was then formed to say that let's create an insurance company that will be focused particularly in insuring these events so that should they happen and when they happen, that there will be cover for those specific uh, uh, structures and businesses that would be affected. And it goes actually even further to personal lines where you insure your own home as a private individual. But now what took place is that at that time in 1976 to 1979, actually Sasha was actually formed in 1979, um, was that the, the, the focus was largely to big corporates, to big businesses. And that is why even up to today, the business model of Sasria is that we work with the private insurance companies that are there, all South African insurance companies. Um, they are Sasria's distribution channel. So in other words, um, when you take out an insurance policy with any insurance company in South Africa, Sasria would normally be added as an additional cover that you pay for. It's a very small little premium that you pay compared to your, your normal insurance, traditional insurance premium. So, and that is because Sasra has got a pooling mechanism. It's the only entity that insures and therefore the premiums that we are charging are extremely small. However, because the distribution is such that it is distributed to traditionally large businesses and, and entities that have access to, to, to insurance. So it gets embedded to that. So what has happened now is that the new um, 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 riots that have taken place now are very different from those that happened in the past. So in the past, they had a face and it was deliberate and it was specific as to why those unrest were actually taking place. And when whatever issues that were being fought against were resolved, then you know there was, there was a change in the narrative. Whereas now, I mean, you saw even the pictures, the, the looting that has taken place, even small businesses, even small to medium enterprises, even, I mean, small businesses in townships were actually uh, uh, looted and, 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 and put to fire uh, and all of that. And all of those things really pretty much meant that the entire business is actually at risk when it comes to this. The biggest problem with this is that this becomes a very systemic risk that if it starts in a particular way, it's got a potential to spread and it can easily spread even throughout the country. 
And that risk is the, the, the insight. That risk of unrest is not insurable by your normal insurance policy. There is actually an exclusion in your, in, in your traditional insurance policy that excludes that type of cover because there is a SAS rate that is reserved in particular for that type of cover. So that's the first thing that um, most entities, particularly small entities, do not know. And it is really a, a big problem because if you look at how much it costs to buy insurance at Sasria, it's really a negligible amount relatively compared to what you would pay on your normal traditional insurance company. So it is really put together in such a way that it is accommodating to everybody. So Sasra insurance cannot be declined. We cannot refuse insurance for anybody. Um, and we cannot even cancel that insurance as well because we are the only entity that is able to provide that type of cover. Therefore, it means there is no selection against any party. And even the level of, of risk involved in that type of business um, is neutralized throughout by getting all the good and the bad business all together into one pool. And as such, then it means then that we allow an optimal mix of being able to manage that risk. So the biggest problem now is, is that SASRA is there um, and most of the big businesses will, will pretty much be okay, especially the ones that are insured because the, if you're looking at the amounts right now that we'd be looking at are really, really, really big figures. Um, the, 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 the total economic loss, I think it's, it's, it's estimated to be in, in, in 50 billions around there. Although not all of it is insured, um, a portion of it is insured. It could be estimated still even now we, because we're still tallying up the quantum to determine how much Sastra is in for, but even that is in the billions. So as such, it means that there are a lot of entities currently that are not covered, that could have been covered. And if you're looking at the, 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 the benefit versus the cost, it's a no brainer that each and every single enterprise that is out there must have this type of cover because it's a negligible premium that you pay. And it was designed from the first place to alleviate pressure from government having to pretty much scramble around and try to provide export financing which we all know is always associated with delays. So those entities that do have access to that insurance, um, Sasha has got very efficient and effective mechanisms in quantifying the damage and paying the, the claim as soon as it is possibly, uh, uh, it is possibly um, calculated. So the question of, so, so what is special risk then in particular? So to, to, to put it maybe in a simple way, so the term, it, it, it normally denotes from, um, um, three things. The first one is the type of exposure that we're talking about. If the exposure is so, is so high and it is a complex exposure to, 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 to manage or to underwrite, and it turns to be systemic, it, it can even be categorized by other characteristics. But the bottom line is that those three elements, if they are normally present, and if that risk were to materialize, it has the potential to spread countrywide and, and, and really cause a lot of damage and the, the appetite of the private equity out there in respect of transferring that risk is minimal, then it becomes a special risk. So it means then that there's a gap in that market and that's when then Sasha would come in. So it normally falls within, if you look on the left-hand side of the screen here, um, excluding the, the economic risks, because those ones can be managed and they're manageable, but the ones that have got the potential to get out of hand are the social risks as well as the natural risks. So Sasha, right now we are um, we ensure the social risks, and in the next slide I will go into what are those specific social risks. So there are uh, three things pretty much that we um, that that we that that we ensure the big three big perils. The first one is public unrest, which is pretty much the, the biggest risk pretty much currently that we are faced with. So. All, all that it means really is that um, 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 public unrest, yeah, I think the best way to describe it would be to say that public unrest is, it's got many names. Um, it could be civil unrest, it could be social unrest, but all it is really, it is something that starts as a protest. Now, in South Africa, a protest is legal and it's a democratic right for people to be able to protest for whatever reason that they're protesting for. 
The problem becomes that when that protest, which is a legal act that anybody can, can do, escalates, right? And then it, it now turns into something that is um, violent first. And it then becomes, that's when rioting becomes then an issue. And that's when looting then becomes an issue. And that's when vandalism and violence and us and you know, uh, torching of buildings and all of those things, when it escalates into that, then it becomes a public unrest. So, and, and, and that's one of the biggest issues really that has happened now, because generally when you look at it, um, there was this sort of unrest that took place that escalated and then people started looting and doing all sorts of things. So the activity that follows the peril itself uh, then gets covered automatically because of the public disorder nature of it that would be the approximate cause that causes this whole thing to escalate to the level that it is escalated. So that is one of Sastra's first and biggest uh, perils that we cover. The other one that we cover is strikes. So strikes is, is, is always generally associated with employees. So the collective refusal of employees to accept a particular uh, work condition. Uh, it normally, we see it normally with increases where they, when they refuse to accept a particular increase um, or they want higher increases or whatever the case may be, uh, when those things happen or when there's a, a, an employment condition that the employer wants to impose on the, on, the, on the employee and the employees, they feel it is not fair. And then they would normally then um, protest again, um, go and strike, but those strikes, they escalate and turn violent as well and employees would then burn down the trucks of the employees if, of the employer if it's the trucks they have or buildings or whatever the case may be. So that is the other peril that we cover, um, the collective refusal of, of employees to accept and then turning into violence as well. Uh, and then the, the last one is um, uh, terrorism um, that we cover as well. Now, uh, again, terrorism is, is normally politically driven you know, to a very large extent. Although in certain instances, it could be an issue of a public affair that is being um, uh, intentionally used to achieve a particular uh, goal, whatever they, for whatever reason that is. So, and then what they do in an essence is they induced terror by maybe wanting to overthrow or, or, or to do anything really of political nature by a particular movement um, that has a particular political agenda that they want to drive. So that in itself, it's normally associated with um, extreme damage. Like we saw what happened in, in, in America, um, you know, with the World Trade Center. So those are the type of things that, that, that Sastra covers in particular. So what then would have happened is that what took place now um, the entire South Africa, particularly small to medium enterprises, should have been covered by Satria because there is no excuse of affordability because it's extremely affordable. And when I say extremely affordable, I can give you an example um, for a vehicle, you know, a really, uh, um, 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 you know, well-priced vehicle, you would pay a premium of close to a thousand rands a month on a normal traditional insurer to replace that vehicle. But for perils that are SASRA related, insuring that one vehicle, um, it's, it's pretty much a fraction of that. I would say about a 10th of what you pay normally for that. So there's really no reason why anyone who can afford to be have to have an asset of that nature, not being able to protect it with a fraction of, what, of, of, of the value of that particular item. So, so that's the one thing. Um, and then now that we understand who Sastra is and why Sastra is there and what Sastra up to this point is covering, um, the question is how do we then ensure moving forward, the issue of rebuilding now, that we are able to ensure that should an eventuality like this happen again, that we are ready for it, first of all, and secondly, that the, the most vulnerable, which is the one thing I want to emphasize, the most vulnerable businesses, which are normally the small to medium enterprises, because the entrepreneurs themselves, they sacrifice quite a lot to get that running, although it's a smaller scale, but if something happens that threatens that, it threatens their entire livelihoods themselves. 
And that the same goes with individuals, you know, working class um, and even levels lower than the working class um, that have, simple example, a house in a township that is worth say 300,000. And if there is something that happens and it gets torched, um, even if it is insured for normal traditional insurance, it would not be covered if it is as a result of a public unrest. Um, and that's when, that's why SASRA is there. So the, the question is, how do we ensure that even those most vulnerable individuals who have assets that are so small and yet valuable to them because they protect their livelihoods that they move forward? So there are two issues. The one is that in, 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 in having assessed the current situation, we've realized that the customer insight is that most individuals, we're talking about individual people, as well as small to medium enterprises that we, we, we've done some research on and spoken to, most of them do not necessarily know the risks that are hidden that they have that could potentially affect their livelihoods that Sasha could cover. That's the first thing. Secondly, they don't even know how affordable it is and they don't even know that there is a SASRIA. And we understand that because our business model is such that we are embedded to the traditional insurance companies, they would, the assumption was that um, the insurance companies would cover them for that eventuality. But the bottom line is that the SASRA is normally embedded onto that. So there needs to be some sort of a, a relevance exercise, some sort of psychological contracting that we as SASRA are gonna be going on a drive to, to ensure that we are known for who we are and why we're there and that we will pretty much aim to cover these specific individuals. And then the question is then, how do we cover them then? Because then some of them might not necessarily even afford a traditional insurance company uh, premium. However, they do feel the need to have a SASRIA because of the small nature of the premium that we're able to pay. And then how do they then get to pay? So, and that's why we, we, we talk to entities like, like, like SAFI, for instance, because it is through aggregation of the, the members, as, a, as an example, that have the same types of risks, one. And secondly, they also have, uh, because the association is there and there is a flow of cash between themselves and the association already. And the association, as it currently stands, they, it stands to protect the rights as well as the livelihoods of the entrepreneurs that own these type of particular entities. So we felt it would be a good start for us to start sharing this type of information in this platform and being able to find alternatives insofar as finding solutions that could be packaged for homogeneous groups like the furniture industry. Your risks are pretty much the same. You have entities that are attractive to opportunistic looters when something like this happens, because what is it that they want to do? They want to get into your business and they want to pretty much take. And you need protection obviously against that. And there are additional measures that we also putting in place to ensure that in your insurance policy, it will cover you even for, should there be a looming um, eventuality of something that is starting up close to where you are. Sasha goes as far as to pay for the cost of having to appoint and get security to protect the building, to protect the, the assets as well as the content and, and the stock of the various entities. So we, we, we're willing to put together structures and, and, and products that are specific to the needs, but we need to understand what the needs are as well so that we structure it in such a way like that. That is why the aggregation of um, the, the, the product delivery to homogeneous groups works because then everybody has the same risk and everybody would, would pretty much say what the needs are and then put together uh, solutions that would be specific for that type of um, um, uh, target market, if you like, and we can be able to get to them uh, together with the association, if it's an association that you're talking to, and we can find where your flow of, of flowing cash in between so that we, we don't necessarily always have to rely or require them to acquire traditional insurance so that Sasha could be attached to that. Although the cost of Sasha is so minimal, um, we need to find a way of, of channeling it directly. So moving into, obviously this is it is more talking to the individual uh, uh, um, people to ensure them in their own personal capacities. But I think the, the focus is more on the SMME component, 
which is why really my, my ending shots here or my parting shots here would be to say that we are here as Sastria and we've realized that there's a gap in the SMME space and we are willing to put together uh, um, specific solutions uh, obviously at reasonable uh, um, 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 costs if you like um, that would be able to 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 support the particular um, sector um, and, and we're able to to structure in such a way that it is tailored for this sector and it covers the needs of this sector and, and and because we can be able to pull these resources together then we can do it obviously in such a way that the more scale we get the the, the more lucrative um, um, the product would be for that particular market and the more we could be able to 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 work with the pricing of it because the the idea here for Sastra is to alleviate the pressure of the fiscus right now there are a couple of billions that treasury has to put together to try and support small to medium enterprises first and to relieve the small to medium enterprises and that relief is going to take a bit of time because it's exposed unfortunately and whereas if it is ex ante prior to the event, then it, 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 it pretty much takes a very short tail to, to get to everybody and everybody knows where to submit and the specific information required and there is um, assessment of the damage so that the individuals are not enriched and they are not given less than what actually the damage is, is to put them exactly in that sweet spot as to where they were before the particular event. So, Benedict, I'm going to pause there um, to allow for, for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Musi, for that very informative presentation. Um, I do not see any um, questions in the Q&A function. Um, I'm not sure if at this point in time um, anyone would like to um, ask a question. Um, so, but at the moment, there's no questions. I think we, the, the Q&A um, panel is open during the rest of the presentations. So please feel free to drop any questions you have um, in the Q&A uh, function. And we will then uh, possibly at the end of all the presentations, Musi, uh, just uh, touch base with you again, if there are any questions pertaining um, to, your, uh, to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So I'd like to uh, introduce you to our second presenter, um, Mr. Mark Elias from the Industrial Development Corporation. Um, Mark has been employed by the IDC for 14 years and worked predominantly in the clothing, textile, footwear and leather space, uh, focusing on deal development. Um, he also spent two years um, as the CEO of one of IDC subsidiaries um, before rejoining the IDC in December of 2020. In his current role, he is the head of textiles and wood um, strategic business unit. Um, the strategic business unit uh, focuses on beneficiation of wood products, which includes the furniture sector. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, our furniture portfolio extends beyond just wood products. Um, we do do metal fabrication, uh, glass, etc. as well, uh, when, it, when it encompasses in the furniture space. So that is notable, um, because I know there's many manufacturers who don't, who don't deal in wood products specifically. Okay, so um, Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Bernadette, via SAFI. And uh, thank you to all the participants for making the time to, to listen to us. Um, just a very brief overview of the IDC for those of you who would not have um, encountered us before. So the Industrial Development Corporation is a state-owned entity. We're 100% owned by government. And we are effectively a bank. We are a development finance institution which focuses primarily on industrial development. Um, we were constituted in the 1940s and our first big uh, investment then was Sassel. And we've played a role in many of the big infrastructure investments over the years uh, within South Africa. And 
the one notable thing about the IDC is that it's self-funding. So we do not get allocations um, from government. I say that, but in this presentation, government has actually asked us to facilitate uh, the disbursement of some funding on their behalf, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. And we basically raise our capital in the debt markets internationally. So whether it be through bonds in, uh, in Europe and the States or locally uh, through our commercial lenders, such as uh, Old Mutual and all the commercial banks, that's how we get our, our, our capital. With this in mind, obviously, it does put us in the position that we act as a, as a banking institution and follow general banking principles um, when we do fund into the economy. Now, this does preclude us from providing grant funding to a large degree, although in this case, uh, with post the unrest, we've made an exception for some of our funding. But we need to be sustainable. And to be sustainable, we need to generate some level of return uh, so that we can also access funding at, at, at reasonable rates in the international market. So we cover a broad industrial spectrum, uh, everything from mining to clothing manufacturing and everything in between. So there's, there's no industrial sector that we will not play in. Uh, the furniture sector is unique in many ways. And um, they added uh, last year that that sector would now fall within or form part of the clothing, textiles, footwear, and leather space. And for the simple reason that there are synergies um, with it uh, in terms of the value chain, obviously from a, a textiles perspective and how that feeds into the furniture sector. And um, the backward integration into the wood uh, and wood products sector is falls within our ambit. So that's how we've, uh, my strategic business unit has uh, inherited the furniture sector. Okay, with that brief background on IDC and where we play, um, as soon as the unrest hit uh, a few weeks ago, um, the immediate reaction was from the IDC was how will we be best suited to support this? support industry getting back on their feet, especially in KZN and, and limited, more limited in Gauteng, where the biggest impacts were seen, but also taking into consideration that value chains were disrupted during this process. Um, so there would have been a direct and an indirect um, outcome for companies. Um, it's very simple to assess the, the direct impact where companies were looted and in the worst circumstances uh, set alight and burned to the ground. In other instances where there are more indirect uh, impacts, it would be where the value chain was disrupted to the degree where companies had to shut down due to a lack of raw material uh, as they, they couldn't be transported. Um, and, and we've seen elements of that across various value chains, of which furniture is one. Now, the biggest impact there is obviously on the loss of jobs, um, which is a key criteria for us to be funding against and supporting. With that in mind, um, the IDC then looked at how it could facilitate and, you know, and um, assist companies through this through this process of rebuilding. We've, uh, and thank you to my colleague from SASRIA to, to shedding some light as to the impact that SASRIA has on, on our economy and, and in industries um, and how they support that. So the, one of the key things that we looked at was obviously most companies would have been insured through SASRIA, not all companies. Um, and that's an important distinction. For the companies that are insured and um, would be playing a claim with SASRIA, there's obviously a period 
where the claim will need to be facilitated. And the extent of that or the timing of that is not always apparent. We then decided to do bridging finance um, to support companies, to allow them to start rebuilding as soon as possible, rebuilding, restocking as soon as possible so that we could get people reemployed as soon as possible. And this would be pending the receipt of the insurance proceeds. The second element we looked at was to fund um, short-term operational losses, which would be incurred due to the work stoppages that uh, were seen. Now, this would vary from company to company, depending on the extent of damage or lack of supply chain or supply chain interruption. Um, worst case scenario, we're probably looking at 12 to 18 months where factories need to be rebuilt. Uh, in the shortest span, it could be as much as two to three weeks as people restock uh, and the, the, the raw materials are easily accessible. Um, but we will play a role in supporting that. The key element there is that the company must have a clear idea of its recovery within the ambit of the current situation. The third element is general working capital funding. Uh, and that's primarily to support uh, the business in the interim. And then the fourth element is uh, capital equipment funding. And this is especially utilized to replace um, assets that were damaged or looted um, during the unrest. And once again, this is to enable companies to get back on their feet as quickly as possible in the shortest time frame possible. Um, because one of the biggest impacts that uh, we've seen is a lot of the companies or the majority of companies that have been impacted are not in a position to continue paying employees without the requisite revenue generation. So this leaves employees at the loose end. Uh, and the bridge we are trying to create is to get that, shorten that lead time to when people could uh, get back to earning an income. To facilitate this, we did, we alluded to three elements. So the first two elements there, the post unrest business recovery funds, those are IDC funds of our own balance sheet that we have ring-fenced uh, specifically to, to assist in, in the short to medium term. The third element there, the MSEP stabilization fund is a IDC fund, uh, IDC managed fund, but uh, the finances are actually received from the DTIC's allocation and treasury. In terms of the, the post unrest or business recovery funds are on balance sheet funding. It's been split into two elements. The 1.4 billion is effectively a debt element where we advance loans to businesses in general. And the 100 million rand, uh, which I've indicated is grant funding, is, that it is for a very specific purpose. The one thing we could not um, leave behind is the impact that this had on township businesses or smaller businesses and businesses in, in traditionally rural areas. Um, and the reality is that these businesses for all intents and purposes would not um, be in a position to afford elements of debt funding of any significant nature. And in certain instances would not form part of the formal economy. So we've ring fenced a hundred million rand, which we would facilitate uh, for these kind of entities. And generally we would not lend directly to these entities. It generally would be through a third party um, and generally NPOs or NGOs who would then facilitate uh, the advances of this. The MSEP stabilization fund is 
also a debt funding package, um, but at, at the very preferential terms, and we'll get to that in a moment. So the qualifying criteria um, for these is that businesses obviously must be able to demonstrate that they were affected by the undress. And they must be able to indicate that they can afford the debt into the future. Um, and, and the reason for this is that not every company will be able to repay the advanced uh, facilities through the claim of the SASRIA claim, because that will go through an adjudication process. And uh, if you claim the 100 Rand, you might only get 90 Rand. So there might be a shortfall, depending on the set of circumstances. And for the uninsured or partially insured, um, we also needed to make an allowance and ensure that at if they were profitable before or cash generating, that they'd be able to get back on their feet within a requisite amount of time and get back to a positive cash generation um, business. And then it's only limited to South African companies uh, that were affected. Um, there are a few international companies that were impacted by this. Um, retail companies, for example, are not necessarily international, but were severely impacted uh, by the unrest. And in general, the IDC does not does not have a mandate to support retail, uh, especially listed retail, as they have their own access to their own resources. For the period of, for the, the purpose of this fund, um, we are relaxing those regulations a little bit to get the opportunity to look at if we can assist retail. And when I say retail, it's not necessarily your listed retailers such as uh, the Mr. Prices and so on of this world, but we cannot ignore that there were many smaller businesses, retail businesses in KZN and in Gauteng that were impacted by this through looting. and. Um, it's incumbent on us to see if we can assist with that. And then the client will have to undertake that there will be no retrenchments for the duration of the funding support. Um, that is key. I mean, the basis of us providing this funding is to try and get people reemployed in the shortest period of shortest space of time. And for that reason, we we clearly stating up front that if your intention is to retrench anybody, then we we cannot support you for that during the loan tenure. Um, so just getting back to the M the MCEP, and MCEP stands for um, Manufacturing Competitive Enhancement Program, um, which is something that's been run by the DTIC for many years now, and the basis of it is to support industry to grow and create additional jobs within the industry, all industries, industrial development. Um, so the, the MCEP um, program is limited to 30 million Rand per applicant. And the basis of that is that it's a co-funding mechanism. And with a maximum of 30 million rand per applicant. The idea is that the IDC would co-fund with MCEP um, to provide your total need. For example, if your, if your company need is 20 million rand to get back on your feet and get everything restarted, uh, or to bridge uh, as bridging finance, we could utilize uh, 10 million rand from the IDC's fund and 10 million rand from the MCEP fund to get to your to uh, total of 20 million rand. The MCEP fund cannot be used in isolation. The MCEP fund is preferential in pricing, is that the loan pricing is 0% for 24 months and thereafter 2% uh, for the remainder. 
sorry, the one thing I neglected to include here is that the tenor, the tenure of the MCEP loan is 48 months in total. Okay, so your loan period for the MCEP component will only be a maximum of 48 months. Whereas the, the funding, uh, the IDC funding specifically extends to 60 months. So when we get to the IDC funding, and this is specifically the 1.4 billion rand um, fund. If you look at this table on the left, you can see what the funding can be utilized for the instrument. So it can be utilized for bridging finance, working capital, capital equipment, or infrastructure. And infrastructure uh, involves um, buildings effectively, especially for those that were satellite and uh, need to recover or damaged quite severely due to the unrest. The max amount for this is also 30 million rand. But what's important to note are the terms of these, the maximum term or duration of these loans and the pricing. For bridging finance, it's a very short term facility of 12 months. And we offering the loan at 0% interest for that period. The intention there is that you've lodged your claim with SASRIA. Um, and we will we then utilize the SASRIA proceeds to settle that claim, or the business will utilize the SASRIA proceeds to settle the loan um, before the 12 month term. If the 12 month term is exceeded, then that uh, facility will convert to a term loan of 48 months at the interest rate of prime plus one. Okay. The working capital facility has a term of 36 months. Um, and this is also it's medium term finance to allow the companies that were looted more especially um, to reestablish stock holding, whether it be raw materials, finished goods, Etc. while covering some of the expense requirements during that period. And that 10 years, 36 months, and it's 0% for the first 12 months in terms of interest, and thereafter prime plus 1%. The CapEx facility is similar in pricing or exactly the same in pricing, but the 10 year is, is longer at 60 months. Got it. And that 60 months is to allow for, um, uh, for the CapEx to be purchased, installed, operational, et cetera. So, you know, that's why it demands a longer tenure. On the infrastructure side, obviously anything to do with buildings, whether it's rebuilding or uh, fixing or repairing, um, that 10 years, 10 years, and the loan there from inception is at a pricing rate of prime plus one. So these four instruments broadly cover whatever situation a company should find themselves in. Obviously, you know, if we work alongside SASRIA, then the bridging finance facility makes a lot of sense um, in that it doesn't add any additional debt burden to your uh, long-term debt burden to your business. And effectively, all you're doing is awaiting the proceeds, your claim to be processed and paid. And then those proceeds, um, the client will have to then settle their, their loan facility with the IDC. And of course, we will include that as a requirement as part of our legal agreement. So not putting the onus on Sasria as we can't take a session uh, of those proceeds, but the onus will fall on the client to ensure that they make good on their commitment to, to repay the loan at the end of that, uh, or when their claim is, is paid out by Sasria. Okay. So the IDC has 
there's always been a claim that the IDC takes too long to, to provide funding or to provide the access because our process is quite uh, onerous. So we've tried to take that, heed those comments and reduce the information that we require to make a decision on and, you know, the, the basic supporting documents that, that would go along with that. Um, I'm not going to go through every element here uh, for the information required, but the questions are fairly generic um in terms of requirement and and this is basically for us just to get a good sense of the development impact of what we what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve with the fund um and the supporting documentation should be available through with with any operating company the one difference being that we speak about a business recovery and turnaround plan um, with specific focus on the next six months. And all that is business owners to tell us how they see the recovery panning out over the next six months, six months, six to 12 months in their business. What are the key things that they would need to do or key interventions that need to be put in place to ensure that the business successfully uh, gets back on its feet? Because what we ultimately want is a sustainable business going forward. Um, we are going to be sharing the presentation with you, so uh, I'm not going to go through every element uh, on here, but obviously, if there are any questions, we, I would be more than happy to, with my colleagues on the line, to answer uh, where we can. Um, Officially, the IDC is launching this today. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we couldn't launch earlier because there was a lot of communication between the DTIC and IDC. At nine o'clock uh, this morning, we got to go ahead to officially launch. So you are the first group um, to actually see or have insight into this presentation or some of this information. Uh, it will be on our website. It should be as of 10 o'clock. I did check at 10 and it wasn't there yet. Um, any inquiries can be directed, inquiries or applications can be directed at the recovery at idc.co.za website. Or if you want to engage with uh, me directly, my email address is there as well. And as well as the business development manager, Mr. Larry Alcock, um, who specifically focus on the wood and the wood product sectors um, and is working very closely with the team looking at the furniture master plan. So he will be the point person um, from our SBU uh, in this matter. But you are more than welcome to contact us with uh, any questions or queries or points of clarification outside of this. Uh, thank you, Bernadette. That brings me to the end of uh, my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, myself and Larry will be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mark, for that very informative presentation. Um, and we are uh, chuffed and glad to hear we're the first audience um, to actually um, be presented with a presentation. Thank you very much. In the Q&A, we don't see any questions. Um, that's been um, listed there. So I think we should uh, continue. As mentioned, um, we will share the recording as well as the presentations and the contact details of the presenters. And we'll also be including a, a SAFI survey link that we would like the uh, attendees to actually complete and um, submit to us um, in terms of that. Finally, we'd like to thank our panelists, um, Mark and Musi, for the um, time they've afforded us. Thank you, Musi, uh, Mark, um, for the time afforded and your willingness to engage with um, our members and our attendees today. Um, and yeah, to the attendees as well, thank you for your time um, that you've uh, 
uh, set aside to participate in this web webinar and in this session. And we would like to wish everyone a great afternoon further. Keep well, keep safe and take care and goodbye. Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Musi.